Good evening. How are we tonight? Sorry I'm a little late. I, I didn't foresee when we started having the Mass in Spanish on Tuesdays that we'd have a flock of people now trying to enroll classes now and being the only person in the parish right now that speaks Spanish. I'm a little late, sorry. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you praise and thanksgiving for this day, for this opportunity to come together to continue to seek to grow in our faith, our understanding of you, our understanding of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. We pray that you may be with us this evening, help us to understand your love, understand what true hope consists in, and truly grow in our faith during this time. Be with us during this time. Give me the words. Um, give um, us all here um, the patience with each other to continue to go down this path um, slowly, arduously, but fruitfully. We ask all these things in your Son's name as we pray together in the words that our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, we are ending hope tonight. Don't worry, we aren't, like, stopping having hope. We're, tonight's the last night. We're going to talk about hope um, as far as the theological virtue. Uh, we've talked about it for the last couple weeks. Um, and when we've talked about hope, it kind of builds on that first gospel value, that first theological value that we talked of, virtue, that we talked of, of faith, that we talk about where our faith comes from. It's a gift given to us freely by God that we then embrace, we then grow in, we then learn more about. And then hope um, is that next um, gift of the theological virtues that God gives to us. And it's aspiring for something more than what we can truly conceive of ourselves. Um, there's a line that many times we look at um, when we're in the midst of a difficult, many times impossible situation, this phrase continually comes to my mind. Uh, growing up, my brother would say this phrase all the time. My dad would say this phrase all the time. And all it did was push the button that said, just shut up, leave me alone. And the phrase would always be when I thought I was up against an insurmountable odd, this too shall pass. You ever heard that before? this too shall pass. And we hear that and we say that trying to help something out, trying to help the situation, trying to fix the problem. The problem, though, is if we are in a boat that's rocking <laughs> and craziness is going on around us, someone coming in with that great platitude saying, this too shall pass, all we want to do is pass by that comment. <laughs> you know, Many times we don't want to look at what that is actually inviting us to. But when we look at eternal hope, it's trying to get us out of the storm. We have the gospel passage um, where the disciples are on the boat. You've probably heard this before, and I'm hoping you've heard it before because we do it every three years in the gospel at Mass, so you've at least heard it a couple times, hopefully, if we come to Mass. But in the gospel, the disciples are asleep on the boat, and the storm is rocking, storm is rocking, raging on around them, and the waves are lapping up over the side of the boat. And then they wake up, and they see this image on the water coming to them. They begin to freak out. And this image is what? Christ walking towards them, right? And Peter says, if that really is you, Lord, allow me to come walk out on the water to you. Remember that? And in that, Jesus says, come on, let's go. And so, as most of us, he's like, like, like it wasn't a wily coyote, like he, he's still going. He's like, okay, we got this. We got this. He's going. But then what happens? Peter takes his sight, his vision, off of what is important, off of what has called him to something more, he loses sight of why he's doing what he's doing, and he begins to realize the wind is buffeting against him, that, that, that the waves are lapping up against his legs, and he begins to freak out. 
And when he takes his eye off the prize, what happens? He begins to sink. It's the same way for us when we look at hope. Hope in eternal life is what really gives us that oomph to keep going as Catholics, as Christians. It's that gift that God gives us that really when we hear the phrase, this too shall pass, should give us hope that, yeah, man, life sucks right now, but remember, it was better beforehand, it was also worse beforehand, and in all of those moments when you were in that valley of the shadow of death that we were talking about last week, what eventually happened? You eventually came back up the other side, right? So when we hear that phrase, this too shall pass, when we allow our anxiety and our stress and that anger to take hold, we aren't keeping our eye on the prize, just like Peter wasn't when he was walking on the water. We are focusing on the things that we can't control. I can control my relationship with God in the sense of I can pray, I can fast, I can be intentional with that relationship. Now, I can't control the outcomes of that. Remember last week we talked about Job and how he really didn't do anything wrong and everything known to man that could have been done to him was done to him? And he was fine with that? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away until he got that physical malady and he got those boils. And then he's like, okay, Lord, (laughs) I mean, all of my er earthly wealth is gone. All of my kids are dead. All of my kinsmen are dead. Yes, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but really? And that's many times where we get frustrated with God is with things that we can't control than trying to control us. Um, I many times make the defensive joke of, I'm a short, fat, bald priest. I say that all the time because, well, I am. I'm short, fat, and bald. I can't change the fact that I'm short. I can't change the fact that I'm bald outside of doing Rogaine, which costs too much, and using extraordinary measures. I can change the fact that I'm fat within reason. I can work out. I can eat healthy. I can work on my diabetes and all those other things. But that doesn't mean they're always going to be perfect. I have to keep working on and working on and working towards them, right? I can control portions of that. But the fact that I got called a shrimp, the fact that I got called a midget, the fact that I went bald at 20 and 21, I can't control that. And so those are the things that when you get picked on the things that you can't control, you begin to identify yourself by that. And so for the first time that I preached and and used that in a homily, people were were laughing. They're like, (laughs) he just called himself a short, fat, bald priest. I said, yeah, what we don't realize is that's all I've seen in the mirror for a long time. All I see are my physical maladies. All I see is the imperfections that exist here. I don't see the fact that I've been created in the image and likeness of God. I don't see the fact that God has given me gifts and talents and skills, and he's given me all of this information and this wealth of knowledge. I don't see the fact that he's given me the gift of faith, and he's given me something to hope in, and he's shared his love with me in ways that I I can't even begin to put to words. All I can see is the imperfections. And many times when we look at that phrase again, this too shall pass, and we get upset, or phrases that are like this too shall pass, like, oh, it'll, it'll get better someday. You guys ever get that sometimes when you're having a bad day? You know what? It really wasn't that bad. That's the worst thing you can say to someone who's having a bad day. It really wasn't that bad. It's like, oh, it wasn't, but it's about to be for you, is normally our response, or at least that's my response, because, well, I'm vindictive sometimes, I'll be honest. But what the Lord is calling us to do is to really set our gaze on what matters, what our eternal hope lies in. And that is the truth that is in the person of Jesus Christ. We've talked this last year and a little bit last year as well about how do we be intentional about our faith? Showing up, that's, that, that's step one. You guys are here tonight. You guys are watching online. Awesome, you're here. But just like when you come to Mass, if you just show up, that's step one. That's not the end goal. The end goal isn't to show up. The end goal is to show up, to receive, to be filled, and then to go out and preach the good news. How often 
do we come to Mass? How often do we come to class? How often do we just show up sometimes, whether it be for church or for other avenues in our lives? And it's like, you know what? Just be happy I'm here. You ever have those moments in life? Just be happy I showed up. Um, you're not getting anything from me tonight. I'm just here. That's what you get. How would it be if I showed up one night and was like, hey, guys, you know what? <clears throat> I had a crap day, and um, I don't want to preach today, so um, let us pray. Some people were like, there is a miracle. There is a God. He's not going to preach for 15 minutes. Some people would actually say that. I understand. Kirk, your wife would be like, yes. I don't have to wash my watch today. Yes. Some people would be like, but, but why aren't you preaching, Father? Are you not prepared? Are you not inspired? Sometimes I'm not inspired. In fact, sometimes it's difficult to preach because I've preached the same thing now. I'm on my third cycle of the preaching. So if you didn't know, when it comes to the liturgical year, we have a year A, a year B, and a year C for the weekend readings. For the daily mass readings, we have a year one, and we have a year two. We are currently on year one A. So year one for the daily mass readings, and year A for the weekend readings. Sometimes I forget when it changes. Because it doesn't change when my brain wants it to change. When do you think the changing of the reading should happen? Beginning of the, of the liturgical year, right? Well, what starts the liturgical year in the Catholic faith? The first Sunday of Advent. What you probably haven't realized, the readings don't change during Advent. You hear the same readings every year during Advent. Did you notice that? Did you ever realize that? We're like, wait, what? Mm-hmm. Same readings every time. So when does the year change? Last Tuesday is when they change. Because last Monday was actually the Feast of the Epiphany. Last Tuesday was the first week of ordinary time, second day of the week. I forgot. And it's like, wait a second. These are the wrong readings. Now, luckily, I figured it out before we got to Mass on Wednesday. And I figured it out before we got to Mass on Tuesday night. So we were still good last Tuesday. Still good last Wednesday. The problem, though, is in the Missal, there is no first Sunday of ordinary time. It doesn't exist because the first week of ordinary time ends with the second Sunday of ordinary time. So, unfortunately, last Wednesday, if you came to daily Mass, you heard the wrong readings because in my brain, you know what? I got the right book out. We got year A out. I forgot it wasn't year two because I had just prepared my homily for weekend two. And so we heard the same readings today at Mass that we heard last Wednesday at Mass. And it was funny, last Wednesday, everyone's looking, it's like, what are they reading here? It's like, yeah, I messed up, it happens. Because sometimes we're so distracted by everything going on in life that there's all of these changes going on around us and we're so focused on the things that don't really matter. We're focused on making sure everything is perfect, making sure everything is going right, because we want to make sure that we don't look like a fool. I need to have that tattooed on my forehead. I am a fool, because I make mistakes. You make mistakes, but it's okay. When we get distracted, when we get upset about those things, we aren't looking to the Lord as our guide. We're looking to saying, why wasn't I good enough? Why wasn't I perfect in that situation? Well, there's a lot of different reasons why you may not have been, but you can't change that. Many times we get really focused in what we can't change. I've talked a lot about the serenity prayer because that, I think, is at the core of really looking at the virtue of hope. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Help me accept the things I cannot change. I cannot change what I have done in the past. You cannot change what you have done in the past. It's over. The problem, though, is many times we're stuck in the past. Well, you remember this one time that you, well, this one time you did, and this one time, that's in the past. Many times we put that into our ammunition wallet when we get in that fight with that certain person. Well, you got to remember that one time. That was 30 years ago. When are you going to let it go? 
And it's not about letting it go, but it's about how do we see what is in front of us and embrace what's in front of us. And if we aren't stuck in the past, which most of us are, have you ever played the what if game? What if I had only made this one decision differently in my life? That was my first two years of seminary, in fact. I played the what if game because I had one foot in and one foot out of seminary. I, I always thought that I could have my cake and eat it, right? Obviously, I can't because I'm diabetic, but that's a completely different sub- subject. But I wanted to go to seminary and at the same time have opened the idea that I could date. I didn't date because I just didn't date. But it was the, I, I didn't give everything to seminary, really for the first five years of seminary, until I was called out on it and put on a pastoral year, much like our seminarian this last year that was with us this summer, he's on a pastoral year this year as well. So he can really see if not only do I have the gifts, but do I have the want to be a priest? Now, seminary is an eight-year process typically, and through that whole time you're called to discern. But do you know what the word discernment means? It took me to my last semester of seminary to figure it out. For me, growing up, the word discernment meant prayerfully considering something. Does that sound about right when we think about discerning? I'm going to discern whether I'm going to take a left or take a right at this next stop. I'm going to prayerfully consider it. But when we talk about our vocation in life, to discern, the definition is more of live so as to be. Let me break that down for you. Live so as to be. So if you're, if you're discerning a vocation to the married life, what is the best way to discern a vocation to the married life? Go on a date. If you're discerning a vocation to the religious life, what's the best way to discern a religious vocation? Seek out a religious order. Ask them questions. See if it's where you may be called. One of the things that I didn't do when I was discerning my vocation to the priesthood or even seminary in general was I didn't even consider, well, maybe I'm called to be monastic. Maybe I'm called to be a Franciscan. Maybe I'm called to be a missionary. My only experience of priests growing up was a diocesan priest. I finally found a home in Oklahoma. So even though I went to eight years of seminary at Benedictine monasteries, there were, there were seminaries at Benedictine monasteries, one up in um, Conception, Missouri, and one in St. Minorad, Indiana. They were all Benedictine monks that were there. Most of the Benedictine monks taught. A lot of the, the um, faculty were also lay people, or um, we had some nuns and we had some priests. And I realized during that time, I'm not called to be a monk because they are too rigid for me in the sense of they like routine, I don't. People ask me, Father, what does your week look like? Which week? What does your day look like? Which day, which week? Okay, what does your afternoon look like? I can get closer pinning that down, but that's always apt to change as well. But for monks, they always know, bell's going to go off at 4.30, get your butt up, take a shower, go, you've got um, office of readings. Go eat breakfast, you've got morning prayer. Go do your daily ministry, your aura at labor, your work and prayer together. Come back, celebrate the liturgy. Go work some more. Come back and do evening prayer, followed by dinner, followed by maybe an hour or two of game night. And again, every monastery is a little bit different. This was my experience um, when I took my diaconate retreat at uh, St. Greg's in Shawnee. Go and you have about, they play, they play dominoes every night. They're loving dominoes. Ooh, we've got a new domino player. Yeah, sure, why not? Um, that's, where, that's where I learned to play chicken feet, which they, the, the uh, senior citizens play here on Wednesdays. It's like, oh, that's, that's how you do that. But I went and did that, and then after that, they'd have night prayer, and then it's time to go to bed. It's like, the sun is still out. It's only 9 o'clock. What do you mean you're going to bed? Well, yes, because our alarm goes off at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, I guess, yeah, you want seven hours of sleep, but I'm not routine like that. There's some nights I'll go to bed at 8 o'clock. There's some nights I'll go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. Depends on what I'm working on. Depends on what's going on in life. Depends on if I'm driving somewhere. Depends on if I'm in town. If I've got something. So like for instance, the next three days, I'm in Woodward all day tomorrow. I'm in Lawton on Friday. And I'm possibly in the city on Saturday um, for the March for Life. Last week, I didn't leave the parish. (laughs) 
So every week's a little bit different. Every day's a little bit different. And so when you're discerning what it is you're supposed to do with your big vocation, married life, um, religious life, or religious vocation, or a single life, you have to actually put on those wheels. Those are things you can control. If I want to get married someday and I'm not dating, I don't really want to get married. I just don't want to get turned down. And that's where I was a lot growing up. I, I didn't ask girls out on dates, not because I didn't want to get married. I didn't ask girls out on dates because I was afraid they would say no. You know, there's only so many times you can be told, I love you, Danny, but like a brother, that you learn, ah, this isn't going to work. I got it. And that was part of, in my discernment, the realization that I'm not called to be a husband. I'm not called to be a dad, but I am called to be a father in the most fatherly way that I can by teaching my children that are all older than me, (laughs) by teaching my children, by coming to their aid, by sometimes disciplining them and say, you know what you're supposed to be doing, and at the same time, loving you guys as God loves me. That that's what I've learned that I can control. So when we look at that serenity prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I can't change the past. The what if game gets you absolutely nowhere except back before you where you started and that gets you nowhere. There's no point in doing it. It's not going to stop us from trying it. But it gets us nowhere. So God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things that I can change. What things can I change in my life? And this is where it comes back to the, to the theological virtue of hope. How can I change my disposition in life? How can I change my starting point? How can I change my today? Well, I have to look and see what it is I'm focusing on. How am I spending time in prayer? How am I spending time in reflection? How am I spending time in conversation with myself and with others? For me, as a priest, it's the, I, I want to make sure that I know what's going on in the office, so I make sure to talk with Amy and Katie every day. Um, I want to make sure that I know what's going on in my family. I talk to my mom literally every day, if not every other day. I talk to my siblings at least once a week when we have our family Zoom, because family to me is very important. But then also, I try and show up at as many events as we have here at the parish. So the Knights of Columbus are having a, um, a new... What's the word I'm looking for? A new registration night dinner right now. That's not the right words, but something like that. Um, new member. That, how do I not remember? Member. A new member registration dinner tonight. And so I made sure to pop in there beforehand. But then as soon as kids started coming in, I popped over and was helping out with that. And we've got some new families that are coming in because we started Mass in Spanish last week. So trying to help out translate in Spanish. But it's also what things are we going to need here at the parish? Well, what things can I control And what things are outside of my scope that God didn't give me the skills for? I am a short, fat, bald, English-speaking person. Spanish and languages is not a gift that I have. I can fake Spanish. And you may say, oh, Father, you can do much better than that. hmm. No. Being honest, it's like, yeah, it's pretty rough. I I understand that. I'm trying. But what we need is someone that can actually communicate with the community. So one of the things that I did was realize, okay, we have an extra office in the office. We had a finance council meeting last night. What do we need here at the parish to help better suit what I can't control? Not so much control, but where I can't be there all the time. So I brought it to our finance council last night, and this is new, so nobody knows this. Um, I've been um, given permission to hire someone part-time in the office to help out in Spanish. So we're looking for someone, if you're interested, 10 to 15 hours a week um, to help translate things into Spanish. Because as this mass in Spanish grows, I talked with one of the other priests, Father Lucian, um, who is actually where I spent my pastoral year and where Patrick is spending his pastoral year this year, I called him to tell him that. It's like, yeah. I started a mass in Spanish. He said, good for you. I will pray for you. It's like, oh, where are you? Back up. Explain. He said, remember when you were here, when we had a vibrant community in Spanish? What did that mean? I said, oh, you mean you got to learn Spanish and have mass in Spanish? And Yeah, that's the easy stuff. 
Remember the meetings. Remember the baptisms. Remember the quinces. Remember the weddings. Remember the house blessings. Remember the, the, all these. Oh, I didn't remember a lot of that stuff. He said, yes, there's a reason why we had things in place by the time you got here as a seminarian, because I had already been here for five years trying to figure out how to make this systematically work out better. They have baptisms once a month on Saturday mornings. Do you know why? Because traditionally, once a month, they would have between 10 and 20 kids that needed to be baptized. Good problem to have. They would have quinceañeras four times a year. Do you know why? They would have them once a quarter. Because if they didn't, they would have one every single weekend. It's like, oh my gosh, 52 quinceas, I couldn't do that. <laughs> five I can do. We've got five right now scheduled, but we've also gotten two new booked in the last two weeks. It's like, oh, I've got to start thinking about these things. These are things that I can control if I have the right people that are around me to kind of look at that. And then is that third, I think, most important part of that serenity prayer, especially when it comes to being people of hope. The wisdom to know the difference between what I can control and what I cannot control. I think that's at the root of the anxiety of the human nature. I know it is for me. Many times I get stressed out because I can't control what's going to happen. And because I can't control what's going to happen, do you know what I do? I don't let it go. I am from a military family. I was a Boy Scout. And both of those, the motto is basically, be prepared. I mean, that's literally the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. And so in that, what do I do? I plan for the worst and I hope for the best. That sounds great as a meme. Sounds great as a motto until you begin to unpack it. Do you know how many worst case scenarios are out there for every situation? There's a lot. And if I'm only focusing on what can go wrong... Many times I don't see what's right in front of me that's actually going pretty doggone well. And that's where Peter fell into the trap in that gospel. He was focusing on what could go wrong. He wasn't focusing on what was going right right in front of him. He had his gaze and his vision set on Christ in front of him. And that was enough. So he could walk on the water for a few steps as he was focused. I'm not saying if you're focused on God, you can walk on water. I'm not saying that. I want to make sure you don't hear that. But I am saying that if we're focused on God, we can do some pretty miraculous things. When we take ourselves out of the picture and our egos out of the equation and ask, what is God calling us to do? How is he calling us to live? That really, I think, gets to the heart of the virtue and the value of hope. Because it's not about money, it's not about materials, it's not about security, it's about eternity. Each and every one of us, and I talk about this way too much, some people think, everyone in this church is going to die at some point. I talk about it because we don't want to face it. But many times, those things we don't want to face are exactly what we need to have conversations about. In fact, I had someone before Mass come and talk to me and say, before Mass, before class, come and talk to me and say, Father, I've got a question about cremations. It's like, nice to see you. How are you doing? Cremations? Okay, we're, we're starting a little heavy, but okay, what's going on? Well, in the Catholic Church, can you be cremated? Well, yes. Well, doesn't something have to happen before you get cremated? Sarcastic father. I mean, theoretically, you probably have to die first. I mean, yes, I, I realize I'm a little cynical. Yes, you have to die, and after you die, you can be cremated. Wasn't well, there something in the Catholic Church that you do to like bless the bodies like after they die before they're cremated? No. Are you sure? It's like, <laughs> let me check. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there's nothing we have to do to cremate the bodies. But there are a lot of priests like myself that if you are going to be cremated, my preference, wait until after the funeral mass. And you may think, well, but that's going to cost more money because 
one of the reasons that many people are going towards cremation is because to get an urn is a whole lot cheaper than going through getting a casket and doing the funeral home and all of those different services. Now, I understand that. But I also had a classmate in seminary die. And I went to his funeral. And I was looking for his casket so I can kind of go say my last goodbyes. And I was sitting on the pew in the back of the church and there was a little box sitting next to me. And I was like, hey, where's so-and-so? See that box right there? That's what's left of him. It's like... And that was back in 2010. I still struggle to grieve his death because for me, I'm a visual learner. I have to see the person, this is going to, again, sound morbid and I don't mean it to be, I have to see the person dead to recognize that they're actually gone. Which became a joke in my family when my dad died. Bear with me. When we went to the wake or we went to the, the, visit, the viewing before the wake of my dad's funeral, we could all swear dad's chest was going up and down. Like, it's like, does he look like he's breathing to you? Like, we all swore. And so we go to the wake, after everybody's said their nice words, and we're kind of sitting there, all sitting there around the casket. My brother says, well, at least he's not breathing. It's like, <laughs> true, at least he's not breathing anymore. But, but it became a joke, because it's like, well, at least now we know that dad isn't here. Now, in that, I still have grief two and a half years later. I still have dreams about my dad all the time. I still have the, those dreams that he didn't really die and that, ha-ha, just kidding, I'm really here. But he's gone. And so, in some ways, with most people, it's the, that is the last farewell, the last goodbye. And so, why do I personally, as a priest, prefer that you have the body present, at least for a viewing, so that those that are left behind can say goodbye? Now, what does the church ask of you if you do get cremated? Bury the ashes. Which means, don't scatter the ashes. Don't divide the ashes. That's a big thing these days, is that, well, I've got a little bit of mom, and she's got a little bit of mom, and she's got a little bit of mom. It's like, uh, would you have cut her arm off and kept that at home? No, that, that's really weird, Father. So is this. Or many of our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters, the big thing in the funeral industry right now, now this is morbid, making jewelry out of the ashes. Have you heard of that? Making like, oh, but Father, my mother's always going to be with me in this diamond necklace. It's like, that's weird. I, I mean, there's no, no other way to say it. That's weird. And basically what it's saying in that is, I can't let go. And I understand that from the, from the mourning and grieving point. I can't let go. The problem, though, is the funeral homes don't care about you letting go at the end of the day. It's about how can they make more money off of different things. And so when we look at the things that we can control and the things that we can't control, we have to look at the why behind every question. And if our answer isn't the Lord, then we have some work to do in that. And so when we look at the phrase, this too shall pass, when we look at the serenity prayer, those are both things that can really help us to look at the why. Hope is most authentic when there seems to be no basis for it. We talk a lot about hope in hopeful situations. But where's that hope in those hopeless situations? We talk about those a lot. We see those a lot. Man, there is no hope for our country. There is no hope for our this. There's no hope for our that. We hear this a lot out there. My question is, why not? Well, because of things that have happened in the past, you can't control those. Well, because just we're doomed to repeat our history. Yeah, if you don't learn from it. Well, we're just hopeless. Why? And then we begin to realize hope is a choice. Just like every gift we receive from God is a choice. God gives us free will. We can choose to embrace it and utilize those gifts of faith, hope, and love. Or we can choose to be faithless, hopeless, and loveless. We even have words for the rejection of God. Realize that? It's interesting. 
We have words for things that don't make sense, but we don't have words for, we can't put into words sometimes those most tactile things that we want to have. But why is it that it's so easy to lose hope? It's because sometimes we get overburdened. You ever feel overburdened in life? Anybody? Or is it just me? We, we, we hear that phrase all the time, God will never give you more than you can handle. I've talked about this before. That is a lie. God sometimes purposely gives you more than you can handle, so you realize you're not supposed to do it by yourself. A, you're supposed to turn to your fellow man or woman, and B, you're supposed to turn to God. And even if you don't get the result that you were looking for by turning to them or to, by turning to God, sometimes just that motion can get us out of that hopeless situation, can help us find the meaning for the what. Why did this happen, Lord? Why do bad things happen to good people? You hear that all the time? We've probably said that at different times. That was, in fact, my big holdup in seminary. We had a class in theology where it was, I, I, I couldn't get beyond, no, why do bad things happen? I, I can't move on until I realize why bad things happen to good people. Why, if God is all-knowing and all-loving and all-merciful and all-kind and all, all of these things, why would he allow such horrific things to happen? There's a, a multitude of answers to that. Sometimes it's because of someone else's choice. Why would God allow this person to get in that horrific accident? Sometimes we make mistakes. Many times, the mistakes aren't ours, but it could be the mistakes of others. Why does God allow tornadoes? Why does God allow hurricanes? Why does God allow, well, what part do we play in it? Now, I'm not getting into politics of that, but that there are some things like, if I do X, it can cause Y. And sometimes in our lives, the things that we do have ripple effects. It's called the butterfly effect. And in fact, there was a movie in the early 2000s that talked about the butterfly effect with Ashton Kutcher. I don't recommend it, but it kind of gives that idea of if you throw a rock into a placid pool of water, what's going to happen? Rock will go down, you have that bloop, and then you have that ripple effect. We forget many times that we aren't the only ones in the world. And I say that truthfully because many times we forget that every action, thought, deed, desire that we do, good, bad, ugly, and different, doesn't just affect us. And that's part of the hard truth of the world that we forget in the 21st century. Many times we think, well, you know what, what I'm going to do, it's not going to affect anybody. In fact, that's the number one um, thing when people are talking about suicide, they say, all it's going to affect is me. It's like, no, it's going to affect everybody that you've ever touched in your life. It'll be easier for you than anyone else in your life because you don't have to deal with the repercussions. Many times we don't think about those things because we are so focused on the problem that we can't see beyond the blinders that the world around us is actually pretty doggone good if we allow ourselves to have that hope if we believe in something more than just what's right in front of us. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Some days you're going to have are going to suck. I'm sorry. But you know what? Some days you're going to have are just going to be the best darn days ever. They have to be. I mean, like, statistically, they have to be. Because someday has to be your best day ever, right? Well, no, that can't be possible, Father. Well, I mean, even if it wasn't the perfect day, it was the best day that you've ever had. So, yes, it is the best day ever for you. Oh, well, I guess that makes sense. Well, look forward to that day. If you don't have anything to plan for, plan for that perfect day. Put it together in your mind what it would look like. And then start making preparations for it. And I'm not talking about days here. I'm talking about the days in heaven. Because as much as I like my naps, which I learned last night is siesta, because that's the one word I couldn't remember in my homily last night was siesta. Go figure. <laughs> I'm looking for peace. I'm looking for where I don't have to worry about stressing about anything. Where I have no cares, in the sense of no concerns, 
no weight on my shoulders. That's what God is calling us to every moment of every day. Many times those burdens that we put, that we have in our lives, are self-inflicted or inflicted by those around us. It's that whole nature versus nurture argument. Sometimes it's based on your nature. It's based on your family upbringing. Sometimes it's based on you're just born with it. I've got four siblings. I'm the only one with diabetes, not the only one with anxiety. We've all got anxiety at some point, but the only one with diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, I know I'm missing at least one thing, uh, arthritis, is that all of them? Asthma, got to be at least something else in there. Can't remember things. I mean, that's, that, 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 that's memory loss, right? It's like that. Mm. Blame, it, blame it all on COVID. But all of that to say, what is it that we're living for? I talk about us being cogs in the machine a lot because many times we're living as if life is going by us, that we have no active part in it, no active role. I saw this movie last week um, with a priest friend, and it was inspiring but also heartbreaking at the same time. So I both recommend it and don't recommend it all at the same time. It's the new Tom Hanks movie that just came out. A man named Otto. I'm not going to ruin it, don't worry. Um, but if you like the movie It's a Wonderful Life and like it in a dark, twisted way, you'd love this movie. But it has some really, really dark elements to it. Really dark elements to it. The idea of loss and what that can lead to in your life. That it can lead to depression that leads to despair, and despair many times leads to unthinkable actions, decisions, desires. And so you basically, the movie is seeing this man's grief, but at the same time realizing it really wasn't that bad. So, so, so again, I recommend it, but I also want to warn you, I went into it thinking, it's a Tom Hanks movie, this can't be, oh, that got deep quick. <laughs> Uh, so if you're not in an emotional state to see it, don't see it. Hope gets, gets a grip based on faith. The heart's conviction that God is trustworthy even when there is no earthly evidence to support such a claim. Have you ever seen things in life that just seem to be so miraculous that you just can't explain it? That it's like coincidence is, is, is not good enough for all of these things lining up in that certain, certain situation. That's what happened, as it's happened to me multiple times in life, actually. Um, I've talked about, um, have we talked about the tornado that took our house before in, in reference to that? Kind of the things leading up to it. So May 20th, 2013, we lost our house in more to, in, uh, to the F5 tornado that took out a bunch of things there. The day before... My dad, he always, <laughs> poor guy, he always got sick. And when he gets sick, God's teaching us a lesson, basically. He got sick, went to the Oklahoma Heart Hospital the night before. So that next morning, May 20th in the morning, he was at the Heart Hospital getting released. To this day, we don't know what exactly happened, but he was having heart palpitations of some sort. The original plan was for dad to go with my youngest brother, Matthew, to enroll at OSU. Mom to be at work. Grandma, who had just moved here from California because her husband had died a year ago to the day, had just moved in with, my, with us in Oklahoma. And so she was supposed to be at home by herself if dad did not have the heart palpitation. But because dad had the heart issues, went to the heart hospital, my sister took my brother to OSU, my mother took my dad home, and was at home with grandma when the sirens went off that grandma wouldn't have been able to hear. So because dad had heart palpitations and my, bro my brother got taken to OSU by my sister and mom was at home and dad was at home and grandma was at home, they were able to get down into the storm shelter and they survived. And grandma lived for 10 years after, almost 10 years after. She passed away last year and a half ago, July. And I say that to say, man, you can call it coincidence, but yeah, I can't explain that. <laughs> um, 
It, it, it just doesn't happen. It took me five hours to get a hold of my dad. Because cell, if you've ever been around when the big tornadoes hit, I mean, Elk City, we've had some tornadoes out here. I, unfortunately, am from Moore, Oklahoma. <laughs> we don't get tornadoes, we get disasters. In fact, when that one hit, the Knights of Columbus National Office came to our house, took pictures of the one in the Columbia Magazine from my bedroom window, which was the side of the wall that was gone. <laughs> And some of the guys that were there from the National Office of the Knights of Columbus said, I was in Vietnam, this looks worse. And it's like, huh? That was my neighborhood I grew up in. Think of the neighborhood that you guys live in, that you've grown up in. Think of Canute being off the face of the earth. That was what the house was. I still grieve the loss of the house. It's been almost, this year will make 10 years since we lost that house. But God moved us exactly where we needed to be, exactly where, when we needed to be there. To Midwest City, right when fracking started. So we go from tornadoes in Moore to earthquakes in Midwest City. You can't make this stuff up. But in the midst of all of those tragedies, turmoils, man, God provides. My parents had just paid the last mortgage payment April of 2013. May 2013, they lose their house. You may look at that and say, oh, that sucks. Except that the house is completely paid off, which means when insurance comes in, they were able to write a check for their next house. Paid. Furnished. Half the size, but paid and furnished. Because dad had been very active in the community, there were fundraisers that had been done. We were kind of the central hub at St. Andrews and Moore, my home parish, for any of the national people that wanted to come and help out anyone in the area. So we had people that drove overnight from San Diego in a U-Haul. They went to the church the next day, had a big clothing drive, had a big fundraiser drive, and collected like $27,000 in cash and a bunch, like a full U-Haul full of stuff, and drove cross-country in two days. They came to my door that next day and said, how can we help? This is all the stuff that we've got. We've taken off the next month from work, put us to work. And it's like, oh, man. We talk about that Oklahoma standard. Being Okies, we get that. But that's the human standard. <laughs> that when people are in need, sometimes we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ. But unfortunately, I misspoke in that sentence. Because I said, when people are in need, sometimes we're called to be the hands and feet of Christ. No. At every moment of every day, we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ. Sometimes it's to people that are in need. How do we allow our faith to be lived and this is what we'll continue on when we start next week, talking about the virtue of love, that third and ultimate theological virtue. We know the song, we know the saying, they will know we are Christians by what? By our love. How we love shows our ability to be conduits for God. As I've said before, one of the worst things that I heard when I was a chaplain at the high school was, man, I hate Christians. They are such hypocrites. They are some of the most hateful people I've ever met in my life. And I'm trying to talk to freshmen and seniors, and it's like, oh, okay, so this is where we're starting at. All right, how do we work from there? We love them. And that's what we're all called to do, not just me as Father Danny, <laughs> not just Kirk as deacon in training, Kirk Estes, not just the office staff because they get paid pennies on the dollar of what they're really worth because we're at a church. Yes, they definitely deserve to make millions of dollars. We can't afford it. But we're all called to love with every action, with every thought, with every deed, with every desire, even if we don't agree with those people. <clears throat> My go-to radio station right now in Elk City is 89.1. Anybody else listen to... NPR. It's the most depressing thing I've ever listened to. But I listen to it to see what's being discussed out there in the world. 
And so after lunch today, I was listening to it on the way home, and it was bad-mouthing one of the political parties and then bad-mouthing the other political party. And I said, yeah, you're right. They do both suck. And it was saying that there's going to be no laws written and approved in the next two years because these people can't get along with each other. Of which I say, God, come now. (laughs) Because that's when politics become political and not human. And we come that way not just with our political world, but in our church world sometimes too. Well, these two groups will never be able to work together. You can never get this group with that group in the same room. Really? What's dividing us? What's keeping us from uniting together? Because we're missing the point if we can't work with each other, especially with those people that we don't get along with and don't agree with. If we can't work with people towards the good, just because they have red behind their name or blue behind their name, you're missing the point of your whole service. You're missing the point of being human. I don't care if you're a Democrat. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're independent, Green Party, liberal. I don't care. I love you. Not because you deserve it, but because I don't deserve it, and God's going to love me anyways. That's where the Lord is calling us to live. That's where that hope brings us back to. That we can, in insurmountable odds, come to agreements in places that just don't make sense. I just finished the first book of a three-book series on the biography of Pope Benedict. I didn't realize that the Cuban Missile Crisis happened in the middle of the Second Vatican Council because it was 20 years before I was born. But I didn't realize that the council actually went on hold because of the tensions going on between Russia, Cuba, and the United States. Do you guys know that? Fascinating. There was a fear that half of the world's population would be decimated because nuclear war was inevitable. Nothing was possible, nothing could possibly stop it. Yet here we are, 60 years later, not in a post-apocalyptic world, in a post-idealistic world, maybe, (laughs) in a post-hope-filled world, maybe. But that's where we look for God to solve things that we can't truly understand. So as I end talking about hope for tonight... (laughs) Any questions so far about faith or hope? Those first two theological virtues that we've had, we've got about five minutes. Or anything else you want to ask questions about? You guys are as bad as the kids. <laughs> Don't be nervous, because I guarantee you someone's going to ask me a question right afterwards. Father, I just didn't want to ask it in, in, in person. Yeah, I understand. Well, if you ever have any questions that come up, you've got my email address, message Eric. He'll get you if you're online. Um, That's one of the things I'm hoping to do, no pun intended, hoping to do with these classes as we go through the virtues, is if you have something that you don't understand, even if it has nothing to do with the virtues, ask. I guarantee you at least one other person that's sitting here has the same question but is just as anxious and just as nervous to ask the question. Or doesn't know the information, like, huh, I never would have thought to ask that, and now I know the answer to that. Awesome. As we continue to grow this class, both in English and then next year, hopefully in Spanish, those are things that we want to do is get behind the why. Why does Father have this class? Well, because the kids are in class, we want to teach them a lesson. That's part of it. I'll be honest. Part of it is I want to have this class at the same time as the kids' class so that the kids can say, I'm not graduating from the church when I get confirmed. I want that lesson to be so in the bones of this church when I leave in 25 years. I have no idea. Whenever it may be, that no priest behind me can ever try and change it. Not because of me, but because it's what they need, it's what we need. How many people are in the church today 
that have left the church at one point. I'm one. I went off to college. We've got other hands being raised. Many of us have left our faith at times. But you know what? You're here tonight, and that's what's important. Do we have a packed church? No. But those of us that are here are here for a reason. Some of it's because Father guilted you at the beginning of the year, and I appreciate you guys still coming. Appreciate that. But I'm hoping that you're getting something from this. If not, let me know what subjects you guys want to talk about. Once we get done with the theological virtue of of love, we could continue on to the cardinal virtues, or if you want to go down a different path, we can go down a different path. We talk about the specific sacraments like we did a little bit last year. Not all of you that are here tonight, I, I want to say only five of you guys that are here tonight were actually in the classes last year. We can rehash some of that as well. Or if you can go back and watch those as well. All of our classes that we have are on our Facebook page. All of our classes and all of the homilies that are preached that are live streamed are on our YouTube page. If you don't know how to find our YouTube page, talk to Eric because I had to Google it. Because I don't do YouTube. Of the social medias, that's the only one I don't do because it's like, that's not social media, that's just video. It's like, oh, that's all of the social media. But that's neither here nor there. As there are no questions, let us end with prayer. We'll get you guys out a couple of minutes early. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this evening, for helping us to understand, hopefully a little better, the theological virtue and gift of hope. We pray that if we are seeing things in our lives that seem insurmountable, that you may bestow this gift upon us in our lives, and even if things are going perfect, that you may continue to maintain this gift in our lives. Help us to see that this too shall pass, that whatever it is we're facing, you will be there for us, if not to give us strength, to be our strength. Help us to truly embrace um, a conversion of heart, a conversion of life, a conversion of mentality based on hope, grounded in faith, rooted in love. We ask all these things through the intercession of your mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, guys.